Welcome to Staffing Stories, hosted by Andy Moss. Andy has been in the staffing industry for over 25 years, first as a recruiter, then eventually an account manager and business owner. This is the podcast where we sit down with fellow staffing owners to get the real stories of the successes, the failures, and the lessons learned along the way. Welcome back to Staffing Stories, and I've changed a little bit of location, so you got a little bit of different background from me, so a little bit uh, different from the norm, but welcome back. Um, got a great guest on today. I know we talk to different owners of different um, types of staffing and recruiting business, but I'm super excited to have Charlie Safro from CS Recruiting with us, and her twist is a little bit different than most. She just works on direct placements and uh, perm jobs, and i happy to have you on and to finally get the chance to meet you thanks andy i'm always down to talk shop about recruiting so thanks for having me as a guest well it's uh it's easy for us to have these conversations we were talking a little bit back in the green room about you know we could probably go on for hours and trying to condense that into you know 15 or so minutes is always uh, challenging for two staffing professionals that is true tell me a little about yourself and just um, kind of give us a little intro of you and your business Sure thing. So I am the president, also the founder of CS Recruiting. We have been in business a little over 12 years, and we focus, as you said, on direct placement, specifically in the logistics, supply chain, and transportation industry. Um, so I started as a one-woman show. Now we've got about 45 employees. We are a virtual company, but we work with clients all over North America, take on searches really in any North American market, um, but the positions usually tie back to some sort of supply chain transportation function. So not necessarily the truck drivers, but um, the people that are behind the scenes making the routes and planning um, the manufacturing, the distribution, and the movement of all the goods that get to us eventually. So that's an interesting question because we hear in the news today, it's supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. So um, how does your company plug into that? You know, we have been working in this business, like I said, for 12 years at CS Recruiting. But prior to that, I was in the industry. And anytime I told people I worked in supply chain, they just kind of tuned out. Like, I don't really know what that means. I'm not really interested. And the pandemic just really gave more insight into our the industry and showed people the importance of what we do. So um, we are helping companies find the right person to drive their business anywhere in the supply chain. That could be you know, securing raw materials, the manufacturing piece, the distribution, storage, inventory management, all the way through to that final transportation and all the transportation in between. So I'd like to say that our team is, um, we've got a hand in helping these companies keep their goods moving, keep their inventory in stock, do the right amount of planning to forecast for the future. Really interesting, complex positions, but um, the nerdy recruiter in me loves it. So did you start your business on the desk as a recruiter? I mean, were, did you start it just singular and, okay, this is how we're going to get going? Not really. I've got an interesting background and I'll, I'll keep it high level, but I started my career in marketing. Um, about six years in, I had my first son. My husband had been a freight broker, so he went right into the transportation industry he had then started a technology company that was probably two years old at this time. And I went back to my marketing career after my maternity leave. It was a grind. I loved it, but it was not the right time for that lifestyle. I wanted to enjoy my new baby. So I asked my husband if I could work for him. He had about eight employees at the time. And literally day one, I was there filing papers and you know, stocking coffee in the kitchen. And maybe two, three weeks into it, um, we got to a point where they were looking to grow and they needed someone to recruit. Um, and they looked at me and said, you're the only one who has time. Can you figure this out? So um, I figured out how to recruit. I taught myself 2006. You probably know, Andy, this was really pre-LinkedIn, even pre-career builder and monster. I was doing a lot of Craigslist recruiting, a lot of, you know, um, putting up posters and coffee shops and libraries, and then just cold calling. So um, we stayed in that business, grew the business to a little over 100 people. 
they sold and I stayed on as like a freelance recruiter for the new company. I think I had two or three searches to wrap up. And then all of a sudden I was on LinkedIn as a logistics recruiter. I started getting inquiries from companies that said, you know, I didn't know that anyone specialized in this industry and new talent and in our space. Can you help us find a sales manager? Can you help us find a distribution manager? Um, and so I took on those searches myself very organically. And then I got to a point where I was like, wait, I, I actually have a business here. Like this isn't just extra spun, spending money and, you know, a, a project to keep me busy. There is a real demand and we have the solution for it. So um, ironically enough, my first hire about a year in was my husband. Um, I had I needed to hire to grow and scale and I trusted him. I knew he knew the industry. He had been an entrepreneur. Um, so he came and helped me grow the business. And then from there, we've just scaled ever since. So working with a family member is always difficult. And sure. I'm sure you probably wanted to fire your husband a couple of times. But has uh, that been a good experience? For us, it really has, I have to say. Um, we have worked together for probably three quarters of my career. We have very different skill sets, very different interests. I am the type of person who loves being at a desk behind a screen all day, just flowing in my work and cranking away. He's more of that you know, face-to-face -face guy. He likes to um, be the visionary and gets his ideas when he's away from a desk. So um, we've complimented each other a lot over the years where he's normally been macro, I'm micro. And then about three years ago, we had made the decision that he was going to step out of the business. Um, everything's good. We're still married. All is, all is great. But um, And then I really took over the leadership function and the macro piece of the business. So he still advises me, but um, it's refreshing. I think a lot of people think like, oh God, that's so boring. You guys must just talk about business at dinner and during your free time, but we love it. Like we have yeah. the same priorities. Our kids come first you know, marriage second, business third, but it's not a burden for us. It's something we enjoy doing together. So let's talk a little bit of, of growing a business. I know for a lot of entrepreneurs in this in this vertical, and even for me, it's okay, we got a great business. Now, how do we scale that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you started in 06, I started in uh, 07. And, you know, that's obvi obviously kind of a rough period of time in our country with some uh, recession mm -hmm. stuff. But uh, walk us through some of the, the lessons learned in growing a business and where you are now versus where you were even 12 months ago. Sure. Yeah. I mean, what's ironic is when I needed to hire our second employee, I had no idea how to do it. I was a recruiter. I could slave away finding candidates for my clients. But when it came to my business, I was like, wow, I don't even know where to find someone or how to sell my own opportunity. So I networked to begin with. And our first hire, who is still with us today, 11 years later, um, her name is Beth. She's our vice president. She was, get this, she was our second cousin's college roommate's best friend from home sister. And that's how we got to her. And so that's really, it, at that time, it was like, this is so ridiculous how I'm just linking all these connections to get to one resume but that is how you do it in the beginning. When you don't have a culture, you don't have a, a retention strategy because you haven't hired and formed a team, you have to think in your network. But it doesn't necessarily have to be the people you know. It's just leveraging those connections to find their connections and their connections. Um, we found our second hire the same way. It was my, my in-laws next door neighbor's daughter's best friend. And Morgan is still with us today, almost 11 years later. Um, from that point, I would say we really started to establish ourselves. Once we probably had four or five employees, um, we built a culture. We weren't intentionally doing it, but it was organic. The way we led our business, the philosophies we had, the values, the processes. Um, and over time, we started to develop a talent brand. And where we are today is amazing. We have candidates that come to us that want to work for us. Um, they see our brand out there. They hear about our reputation, whether they're in the industry or out of the industry. Um, it's taken a long time, but I would say that is like the, the ultimate achievement of an entrepreneur is when your application inbox is flooded for your own position um, because you're doing something right that's attracting people. 
Well, great people refer other great people. Mm -hmm. I've always said in recruiters is the referrals are where you get unbelievable talent. So can, I mean, at postings, yes, you can get some, but man, ask the best employees you got working for you who they know. And they're, they're not going to usually refer someone who's not good. No, nope, exactly. So that, that is interesting. So are all your recruiters remote? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an assumption there. We are today. Um, we started in an office. Actually, when I when I went to hire Beth, um, I remember extending her the offer and she lived in the city. I lived in the suburbs. I said, I promise if you accept this offer, we'll get an office. We'll be a real company. I'll even get you business cards. Um, <laughs> but the catch is that I don't have childcare on Wednesdays. And I had three young children at this point. Um, so I said to Beth, we'll get an office, but you don't need to come in on Wednesdays. We'll just have you work from home. We'll regroup on Thursday. And our entire culture was built off that single impulse statement I made where when we went to make our second hire, she took Wednesdays off. And then we eventually grew our business hybrid before hybrid was a thing. So um, right before 2020, we had about 30 people in an office. Everyone came in Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, the Wednesdays and Fridays, everyone worked from home. And um, we used our days in the office to meet, to create the camaraderie, to you know stand by the water cooler and talk and go to lunch. And then the other days, we would really just dive in and focus on our work. Um, 2020 hit, we all went home. We loved our office space. And we kept saying, like every other company, we'll go back in July. Oh, no, now it's going to be September. And then wait, if we go back now, we need to get plexiglass for the desks. And we need to figure out a rotation schedule so people aren't within six feet of each other. Um, and we just kept dragging that on to a point where we surveyed our team. We had a lot of internal conversations and we came to the conclusion that we don't need an office. We'd been yeah. remote for nine, 10 months at that point. Our production was great. Even in 2020, we were focused um, and the team wanted to stay at home. So we listened to the team and the rest is history. We were out of our lease um, and have been uh, an entirely virtual company since then. I will say we do it a little differently in the sense that we all work from home, but we tr choose to um, hire people in the Chicagoland market, at least okay. at this point. Um, and the reason we do that is because we do still value connection and face-to-face -face time. So work is done at home, but um, the culture certainly is built through the screen. I, I will say it's very, very possible to do that. We also have monthly get-togethers. We have quarterly team building events. We take a an annual trip to Mexico as a retreat as a team. So lots of different ways that we still interact. We just use our time in person um, to be, you know, more more intentional and more about the bond and and who are you behind your title. I know what your title does every day. Who are you as a person? And that's really important to us. Well, it's you know. But we've talked a lot about the good things in staffing. What are some lessons learned that maybe you learned the hard way or through um, a failing opportunity? Just, you know, I want to encourage everybody that's on the, that listens to this podcast that, you know, they are, you know, doing something right. But what, what, what are some things you learned? I've learned a lot along the way. And, and most of these really core learnings that have stuck with me have come from mistakes or failures. Um, even though we are recruiters and we evaluate people and we take a lot of pride in our culture and our team, we've made the wrong hires many, many times. We've had toxic employees. We've had you know top revenue producers who are clicky and causing conflict in the office and tension. So um, Looking back, could we have figured this out earlier? Probably not, but we we learned our lesson. We made decisions and adjusted and pivoted. Um, you know, I'd say the hardest lesson I've learned is that if you are a leader of people, your main focus is to keep those people happy, but you will never fully succeed 100% of the time. And that is how I think of it like my goal every day is to make sure my team feels connected, feels trusted, feels purposeful. But I still go to bed every night knowing that a decision I made upset someone. There is one out of 45 people on the team who is not happy. And hopefully my next decision will improve that. But 
it's a, it's a big weight to carry as a leader, knowing that all you are there for, that is your mission and you will never fully succeed. And if you do, it will diminish at some point. Like you may well, have everyone true. happy at a moment, but then 10 minutes later, something changes. It's, you know, the thing is, you know, leadership is accomplishing tasks through others. And, exactly. you know, and that is never easy. Um, I, you never take it for granted. I know I don't. And um, you sound like you've got an awesome yeah. company. And again, we appreciate you being on this podcast with us just to kind of walk yeah. us through your success. And then one thing I always try to end with, or I'm trying to end with is just some kind of personal. So if you had your streaming Netflix or Amazon prime up there, what's the show we watching? I don't know if I want to admit this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a huge, I'm a huge reality show fan, I will say. And for me, it's like mindless entertainment. You know, I can source and have a glass of wine and have the TV on at night and just get in that flow mode. Um, but I will say that I recently watched Severance. Have you seen Severance? No, I have not. You've got to watch it. It's a super interesting show. I want to say it's Showtime, but it's kind of dystopian and it's all about this idea of separating work and life. And it's the total antithesis of what we're trying to do in the workplace today, where yeah. when you walk into your job, your memory is erased of who you are outside of the job. And then when you go home, your memory is erased of what work you do. Um, it's super interesting. And it just gives a lot of perspective about why culture is important, why people need other people and, and what, what those connections can become because yeah. of what you do outside of work. So that's a, a good reco, especially for anyone in the recruiting business. It's, right. it's mind boggling. So we, so we all have homework. We need to go watch Severance. Exactly. All right. Hey, it's great to meet you, Charlie. And thank you so much for being put on the hot seat today and you know getting a chance to introduce yourself. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Thank you. The Staffing Stories podcast is brought to you by 3DIQ, founded by recruiters for recruiters. 3DIQ's industry-leading product suite complements your submission process in Bullhorn from start to finish and helps you deliver a cutting-edge customer experience. Triple your placements with our powerful resume submission platform, candidate marketing, and client portal. Visit 3DIQ.com stories to learn more.